Hi everyone, why this mark on the capacitor? Well, that mark is extremely important and if that little bit of paint isn't painted at the top of the capacitor, that could be the difference between a complete design failure and design success. In this video, I'll explain exactly why that mark is there and I'll give you examples with the capacitor electrically in circuit and out of circuit showing you the difference Welcome to Mr. Carlson's lab and a brand new tech tip series on this channel. If you'd like to stay current in this tech tip series and learn things about electronics that normally aren't talked about, definitely subscribe and hang around. I'll teach you all I know. Let's get started. The difference between these two capacitors is really quite extreme. You'll notice that this little capacitor here has a marking on the top of it. It almost looks like a little hat, that little paint mark, whereas this one does not. This one actually has its dielectric rating. It says Z5U on it. Well, if you ever see a ceramic capacitor like this that has that little mark on the top of it, that means it's a very special capacitor. It has an NP0 or negative positive zero rating. What does that mean? This capacitor will compensate for temperature difference a whole lot better than this one will. So in order to better explain what would happen, so back this out here and you can take a look. So in capacitors, we have plates like this, and in the middle is the dielectric. The dielectric would be in that little capacitor that we saw with the paint mark on it, this one right here, would have that NP0 rating. So when we heat things up, they expand. When we cool things down, they contract and get closer together. That will cause a capacitance change. And depending on the circuit that that particular capacitor is in, that can absolutely make or break a design. So if we used a capacitor like this one here with the Z5U rating on it, and say put that in a variable frequency oscillator in either a handheld radio or say a transmitter, some form of a receiver, and we use this in a, in a very tightly tuned uh, I guess you could say very accurately tuned oscillator circuit, just the warmth of my fingers would cause this frequency to move all over the place because as I'm warming this up, it's expanding. And then as I heat it or cool it down, it's going to contract and that's going to cause a big frequency change and that's known as frequency drift. So that will make or break any design. And I'll give you an example of that right here. So what I'll do is I'll plug this capacitor into the test fixture over here. So this test fixture now is set up to be this right here. This is a Hartley oscillator. This is the test fixture right here and I will be putting this capacitor right across here. So that's the device under test or DUT. It's in parallel with this little capacitor that's on here already. And this, of course, drives one other stage, which drives the frequency counter, which is the extra transistor you see on there. This little circuit, I show how to make this particular circuit right on Patreon with all the little islands and everything. I've even modified a tool. I share the tool up there and everything. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out. And uh, if you're interested in making this, again, a Veractor and an LED basically using LEDs as varactor diodes or capacitors. That's in the previous video to this. You can check that out. That's this schematic with a different modification to it. So what I'll do here is I'll plug this in. So now keep in mind, this is an open air, just me getting close to this like this. This is how sensitive it is. You can see that frequency moving. You can see how I'm coupling to the circuit. So it's very sensitive, so we're gonna to have to ignore any slight movement from me actually getting close to this and everything, but we'll take a look at the actual capacitors and how they move. So plug this in like so. I think that's making contact. I sure hope it is. Okay, so now you can see that moving. That's from me heating it up with my hand. All right, so I'll just heat this up with my fingers and I'll just let go, ignore this because I'm coupling to this. As soon as I let go, you can pay attention to this. Okay, so now we'll watch this. See, that's just movement. That's huge frequency movement right there just for me heating that capacitor up and that dielectric inside is now cooling down because just the heat of my fingers changed that. If this was in an oscillator circuit, that would be a complete design fail. All right, so 
I'll move that one out of the way. I'll plug this little NP0 capacitor in now. I'll plug this in here. Hopefully I can make good connection with this. Pretty hard to get this into this little small test fixture here. Now what I'll do is I'll hold this for just a moment. Now ignore the movement that you're seeing here because again, I'm coupling to it. So what I'll do is I'll let go of that and look at the difference now. Look at that, it's hardly moving at all. Now you can expect to see just a touch of movement there. Again, because this is an open air. But look at that, basically no movement. How stable that is. That's the difference between an NP0 style capacitor, this little one right here, and one that doesn't have, zoom in on that so you can take a look at that again just a little bit better. One that has that little paint marking on the top, and then of course one that has you know no paint marking whatsoever like this. So this is very important. Now there are other capacitors that will affect other circuits. So say you want to make something that isn't so sensitive, like something with a 555 timer, or say you want to make a timer that uh, is a 12 hour timer or something like that. There are capacitors that you need to use in circuits like that as well. If you need larger values, you're going to want to use a tantalum. Don't use an electrolytic capacitor in a circuit like that because electrolytics are much like this. Tantalums for you know a larger value, if you're trying to create some form of a timer that requires a larger value capacitor, definitely use a tantalum. Do not use an electrolytic capacitor. I see this mistake so often. Since you're still here, you deserve even more capacitor knowledge. This is an electrolytic capacitor and can be used in a timing circuit where the accuracy required would be very low. So a very slow flashing circuit would be absolutely fine, say for just visual effect or something like that. So say you had two LEDs moving back and forth. This here would be absolutely fine for something very slow. But keep in mind, with temperature variation, those LEDs will move just a little quicker or just a little slower, depending on you know, the, the temperature around that capacitor. Again, you know, for very inaccurate situations. For long-term timing applications where you need more accuracy, a tantalum would be preferred. Now, here's the thing with tantalums that a lot of people don't talk about, and this is something that needs to be noted. You'll know on most electrolytic capacitors, they mark the negative side, most, all right? They mark the negative side. On most tantalums, they mark the positive side. So don't forget about that. A lot of the times they'll put a little plus symbol and then put a line there that shows that they're marking the positive side of the tantalum. Don't hook tantalums up backwards because they get pretty grumpy when you do. This here is that NP0 capacitor, so that's temperature compensated. The dielectric inside is basically compensating for the expansion and contraction effect. So this is a very, very accurate capacitor for you know, higher frequency oscillators in uh, you know, HF and VHF use and things like that. This is a mica capacitor. These are also very accurate. And uh, you'll find that these capacitors were used in a lot of older equipment where accuracy was required. So if you're ever going to an oscillator circuit inside of an older piece of equipment, you'll see these capacitors in here. If you needed to replace a, a mica capacitor like this, if you can find the same rating in an NP0 rated capacitor, it would be fine to replace that. Now there are other ratings a lot of the engineers in the really, I guess you could say, accurate oscillating circuits, the higher frequency oscillators, would sometimes compensate the drift of one component negative with the drift of another component positive. So you kind of remain in the middle as one's drifting down, the other one's trying to make the circuit drift up so they compensate each other. That's another thing that a lot of people don't talk about in oscillator design. And of course, that's a lot of hours in engineering trying to create things like that. Some things will drift positive and others will drift negative. So putting both of those in a circuit will cause them to stabilize just by you know basically dealing with keeping things in the middle, right? This here was that capacitor we just looked at that will move all over the place with the Z5U dielectric basically, or rating on it for the dielectric. Uh, again, good for very crude stuff, but you know these are really good for decoupling and, and 
things where the actual capacitance value really doesn't affect the circuit too much. It's basically just to get rid of, uh, well, you know, like a decoupling capacitor to decouple RF and things like that. This is a polystyrene capacitor, and you'll find this in a lot of the European radios, and you'll also find this in a lot of FM radios from way back when. These are also very stable capacitors, but they don't deal with heat very well. That's the problem with polystyrene. You know, you don't want to be heating the legs of these up with a soldering iron very long because polystyrene melts pretty easily. But when they are working, they work very well and they are very stable. Again, replacing something like this with something like this would be the best bet if you needed to replace a polystyrene capacitor. You could even replace it with a mica if you liked in a lot of cases. So there you go, there's some more capacitor knowledge for you. If you'd like to learn about all of these capacitors, this is one of the lessons in my Patreon electronics course. Definitely check that out. If you're enjoying this tech tip series, definitely hang around and subscribe. I'll have many more tech tips videos coming in the near future, teaching you things you may not know about both modern electronics and antique electronics alike. If you'd like to take your electronics knowledge to a much higher level, I have an electronics course where I teach all sorts of very neat things about electronics and share many designs and my creations with everyone there. There is over 225 videos there at this point, and it's counting. Lots and lots of projects for you to build and learn from, both modern and antique electronics alike. Definitely check it out. This electronics course is on Patreon. I'll put the link just below the video's description under the Show More tab, and I'll pin the link at the top of the comment section. So if you click on that link, it'll take you right there, and you can check it out. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.